I'm Molly Prince. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I work in Salt Lake City, Utah. I have a private practice. Um, I've been working with sex offenders for 20 years. I think there's just this idea that there are monsters lurking out there and they're called sex offenders. And I think they don't understand that people who commit sex offenses come from all walks of life and all socioeconomic levels and all intelligence levels. And so I think it's unfortunate there's, there's a stereotype that a sex offender is out there and that they're all alike when in fact we have a broad spect spectrum of sex offenders. There's a huge spectrum of different types and different typologies. And so the registry for many makes them feel even more self-conscious. For some, they take it in stride and they say, well, there's nothing I can do about it. And for some, it, it causes them a lot of fear. Um, they worry about harassment. Um, it increases their fear just that they would ordinarily have coming out of prison or out of jail and doing treatment and trying to reintegrate into the community. Um, I think the first line of defense is everybody in Utah that's that completed treatment in prison is required to do aftercare um, unless they expirate or terminate if they're on parole. So they're going to be doing therapy and I think talking about it in therapy, that's a big piece of what we do in our aftercare therapy is help our clients learn how to live within their restrictions. Having your family and your support system come in and talk to your therapist and understand what's going on can help because sometimes the offender says, okay, I can't do this and I can't go there. And then the family says, well, that's stupid, why not? You know, you didn't do anything to this kind of a person and, and and so the family doesn't know how to be supportive. So I recommend that they try to get their family involved so their family can be supportive to them in following their restrictions. They often feel like they live on the fringe because, so the psychological effect of just being on the registry is there, but then there are the fears of all that that encompasses. So it means they're going to have a harder time finding a job. They already have restrictions put on parole and probation about the types of jobs they can have and they have they have limitations of the types of jobs they can have based on the type of crime they have. The sex offender looking for employment is, so is usually a felon and a sex offender and so depending on the type of application there's a place where you can check if you're a felon or not and then it gives you a place to explain. I have always recommended that they write will explain in interview like, are you a convicted felon? Yes. And then it says, please describe. I just recommend they put, we'll, we'll discuss an interview. And that way they hopefully can get their foot in the door to get an interview and they can be seen as an entire whole person, not just someone who committed a sex offense. So I think there's a need to know basis when it comes to employment, but I think that there's a fine line that they walk. I've had clients that have just gone to interviews and blurted it all out and been told, you know, thank you for being honest with us, we'll call you, and then you never get the call. I've had a couple clients that blurted it out, and it was for a small family-owned business, and they were like, you know, that's not going to affect us. Um, thank you for being honest up front, and they got hired. Unfortunately, now, the hiring d is often done through, your screen through a computer program. So if you checked a certain box, you're going to get thrown out. Um, getting to actually talk to a live person and sell yourself is going to be really important. Well, there again, registered sex offenders have a double, a double whammy. They're a felon and they're a registered sex offender. So some places that will rent to felons won't rent to sex offenders. Now, registered sex offenders already have some challenges. If they're on probation or parole, um, they're not gonna be able to live within a certain distance of a school or a park, a daycare, that kind of thing. Then we've got the law that went into effect back in 2007 that says any registered sex offender um, who has an offense against a minor cannot go to a park, a school, a daycare, a public swimming pool, or places where children recreate. Well, that also then will include if you're getting out of jail or prison and your family has a home on the same block as a school, you're not going to be allowed to go live there. So you're going to have to find a place that 
is far enough away from protected places that are designated in that law. So some families are very supportive of their loved ones and want to give them a place to live or let them at least get out and live temporarily for a few months in a family home. Again, we run into problems if that family home is close to a school or a daycare. The flip side of that is you've got some families that don't really want their address to be on their, the registry because other people live there. I recommend tips. I recommend people find places to rent that are rented by individuals, not big corporations. Big corporations have screening tools that they use and you'll just be kicked out of the system. My experience with families is, you know, if, if they understand their loved one who's committed a sex offense and they make the choice that they want to be there and be supportive, that's a really courageous and strong thing for them to do because they're going to be there through, they're going to do his probation or parole with him. They're going to be involved in therapy to a certain extent. They can learn and understand the, the person's parole or probation stipulations to the letter and take them seriously. Um, an example is you know, no, no direct or indirect contact with children until approved through a probation and parole and therapy and then only with a supervisor that's been approved. Help him follow the rules. Um, come to a place within yourself that you can accept that these are rules that we're going to be living by. Um, if you need to talk about them, find a therapist that, that understands sex offender issues and talk to the therapist about it. Um, if you're finding a lot of resistance within you about, you know, I didn't do this, it's not fair, you have to soul search and you have to say, you know, is it worth it? And, and am I willing, can I accept the restrictions and be supportive and I'm willing to do this for the bigger picture, which is reuniting the family, having our loved one back in the family, that kind of thing. I think, again, they need a good support system. Um, obviously their loved one, the RSO, but if they've got family or friends that are understanding of their decision to be supportive and stay with the person who committed the offense, talk to their support system. They can feel very isolated. Um, there are some cases where it may not be wise for them to share at work, you know, anything about their loved one's felony status or sex offense status or anything like that. I think they each, they need to look at it individually. I've had a couple of clients in 20 years that have, that have undergone some harassment, like pictures of them on the windshields of cars from the, from the registry on the internet. Um, I had one person that was assaulted, but actually, even though it was neighbors, it was friends of the person that had been victimized. And so, Neighbors, I think you need to decide, again, if they're extending the hand of friendship and inviting you over to dinner every Friday night, you probably need to let them know. I've had clients that have said um, to people who've kind of acted strange, you know, if you have any questions, please come ask me. But the clients, I don't recommend you go knocking on doors and saying, hi, I need to let you know I'm a sex offender. I think, again, it's going to be an individual situation. I think that's such a hot potato. Um, my personal opinion is youth don't need to be on the registry, but that's my personal opinion. Um, what can they do? Again, I think they need to talk to therapists. They need to find support with their loved ones. Um, a lot of this whole thing is, is accepting what we can control and what we can't control. So if the law says that my teenage son has to be on the registry, then, okay, we're going to comply. But maybe if I've got a lot of anger and I've got a lot of frustration and I feel like it's wrong, maybe I get a little bit political. And I work at trying to change the laws and I talk to my, my legislators. But the other piece is, is anybody who's ever been convicted of an offense, a sex offense, whether they're juvenile or adult, I think they're going to be under scrutiny. And when people start noticing that, you know, this is really a pretty good guy. You know, he's not, he's not the monster I thought he was. 
that's going to, and, and then there's public education. We need to do, in our country, we need to do public education on what it really means to have a sex offense. I think the other thing is, though, we have this false sense of security that because we have a registry, we're somehow protecting our children. And I just would like to remind people that our children are at risk for the people who've never been caught. 